Hi, and thank you for joining us this afternoon. My name is Kelly from the Association of Corporate Council Australia. In the spirit of reconciliation, ACC Australia acknowledges the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and their connections to land, sea and community. We pay our respects to their elders past and present and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples today. Thank you for attending our webinar with Wispley on how good technology and the right mindset can assist organisations in mitigating the risks related to misconduct and wrongdoing. Before we start, I do want to speak very quickly about the Association of Corporate Council. ACC Australia is the Association for In-House Council. If you aren't already a member of the Association, then I strongly encourage you to join what is a fantastic organisation and take advantage of the many benefits available to members and continue to enjoy the best events for in-house by in-house. A couple of the benefits I'll mention is free professional indemnity insurance included in membership, access to 150 uh, CPD events annually, such as this one, access to over 45,000 online resources and the opportunity to network with close to 4,000 members in Australia and over 40,000 global members of the Association of Corporate Council. We're thrilled to have Sylvain and Justin with us today and I would like to hand over to them now. Uh, thanks, Kelly. I uh, appreciate that introduction and uh, welcome, Sylvain. Uh, I'm very glad you could join us here today to uh, talk about uh, how good technology and the right mindset can mitigate the risks, as Kelly said, of uh, misconduct in organisations. Thank you for having me, uh, Justin. Uh, it's a real pleasure. Now, uh, I've worked with you, Sylvain, on uh, two whistleblower platforms, uh, well, one platform in two different companies, and I know your business reasonably well, um, but uh, there's a fair amount of history there and also how, how you came to be uh, CEO and founder of Whistly is a really interesting story. And I think before we, before we leap into discussing the, uh, the technological aspects of whistleblowing and what you guys are doing at Wispley. Um, I'd be really interested and I think the audience would be really interested to hear your story and your history of how you were uh, originally a whistleblower and how that led you to where you are today. Yes, sure. Um, thank you and good afternoon, everyone. Um, so I'll give you just a, a brief background. Uh, you may have picked up the accent. I'm actually a, a, a Frozy, a French Australian. Um, so I spent 13 years in Australia before um, I uh, landed in Boston uh, just over two years ago. And, uh, and that's in Australia that I, uh, um, I got a job in a, in a company uh, in 2012. And that company used to be called Leighton, Leighton Contractors. Uh, it's now part of a, a group called CIMIC and uh, the company is called CPD. And, uh, and I was in procurement, um, very small team. And, uh, and my role was to optimize the spend. And within um, uh, weeks of being in that role, I actually um, uncovered some interesting, um, I guess, amounts at the beginning and, and vendors and did a bit of digging on those vendors. Uh, and one of them in particular was a cottage or a b, &B. And, um, and the amounts we spent for the previous 12 months was really, really high. And so I wanted to look to learn more about it, bring accounts payable. Um, it was for consulting services, which, which triggered um, even more interest in learning more about that cottage that was billing us for consulting services. Did a bit of research on the internet, found a company director, put that into the um, company directory and got a match with an employee. And so the whole thing kind of unraveled very quickly for me. That took about, you know, uh, a couple of hours. Uh, and then I realized that uh, obviously I had to be wrong. I was still on uh, a probation. My wife was pregnant. I um, had been at uh, Leighton for two months. Uh, and obviously that couldn't happen that someone, you know, stole $20.7 million uh, over a period of 12 years by sending 308 fake invoices. And so I had to convince myself that I was wrong. Uh, and that's the first thing that I realized I had to be wrong because in our society, we're being raised as being, uh, you know, the, the majority is really correct. And in my case, at least, you know, 50 to 100 people saw exactly what I saw. They saw those invoices uh, and no one said nothing. Anyway, after um, another two hours, I went up to the internet, was looking for some document of some sort, um, found the uh, uh, whistleblowing, um, uh, sorry, the code of conduct, and then the uh, uh, 
the whistleblowing policy and, uh, um, and in there was a, a range of channels for me to speak up and I had access to a hotline. It was an external third party provider. I had access to a hotline, a fax, a PO box, a form on the internet uh, and uh, the email address and the beautiful overarching um, um, open door policy. And I was not able to use any of those channels. Uh, it was either because of um, the fact that I had an accent and they would have picked up on the phone. I can't send evidence on the phone and I've got fake invoices. Um, so all of that kind of came up uh, to my mind. The fax, I was 35 years old at the time, never used the fax in my entire life. Um, and, um, and all of those channels were not conducive for me to, uh, to speak up. Um, and again, I didn't really also want to go to an external third party because uh, I thought I had to be wrong and I didn't want someone external to later to go to management and management to come to me and tell me that not only this is not a fraud, but to go and tell a third party you know, outside of Leighton uh, something that is actually not happening. So for me, all of those systems didn't work. And I ended up doing the whistle to, uh, uh, to my manager, um, which is the, the one thing I would recommend everybody else not to do. Um, the reason why I did it was because she was new and I trusted her. And, uh, and within minutes, she went to the office of the managing director. The next day, the guy was interviewed by HR. Um, a few weeks later, or a few months later, he was sentenced to 15 years behind bars. Then in the meantime, the company asked me to become um, an investigator slash internal auditor to see if anything else was actually happening at, um, at Leighton. So that's how I became, a, I guess, a, a whistleblower by accident. And to be honest, I only realized that I, be, that I became a whistleblower after I blew the whistle, when people were talking about this in the media uh, or in the office. Um, so it was kind of an after the fact thing for me. And Sylvain, I mean, <laughs> It's interesting that you mentioned that a lot of people within the office, uh, you suspect, would have known, uh, including yourself. What was the difference? I mean, apart from, from you being probably more courageous than, than other employees, what do you think the difference was between you reporting and them not consciously reporting? So I think what helped me to understand what happened was the two, two and a half years after the event, when I got that title of, of pseudo investigator slash internal auditor, uh, and I, um, I realized there were a lot of, of things happening within the company. We're losing a lot of money due to you know, some type of fraud or corruption or whatever it might be. Uh, but that was not the biggest issue. The biggest issue was actually the impact that this was having on the good people, the people that actually saw wrongdoing and couldn't find the strength to speak out. And um, in my case, what actually happened and what kind of prevented me from speaking up in the early hours was the fear, the fear of being wrong, the fear of what would be the answer or the response from the company, uh, you know, would they keep me on the job or would they fire me? Um, and uh, and for, for most people, um, actually for all people that want to speak up, fear is the main feeling that they feel and that will prevent them from speaking up. The second one, which you actually get in uh, more kind of HR related matters like bullying and harassment and discrimination uh, is um, the feeling of shame. Um, so someone that went through a horrific, a horrific event doesn't want to speak about it, doesn't want to tell a stranger or even someone from the office about it because they know that as soon as they do it, then everybody else is going to be made aware of it. Um, and I guess for most people, those two feelings combined are just too hard to overcome and, uh, and they prefer not to speak up and not to mention that those employees have to pay the mortgage, they have to pay the school, they have to put food on the table, and this is a really good company and a really good job, and you want to keep on getting the paychecks. They can't afford to lose that job, and that's what you know, is preventing a lot of individuals to speak up. So fear yeah. and shame are definitely things that we need to overcome so people can open up a bit. Yeah, and I think the, the anonymity aspect is really important. I mean, you were able to overcome your fear, and it, obviously at some point you made a judgment that, you know, I'm just going to go with this and uh, the consequences may be the consequences. But, you know, for most people, that barrier will be too much. It is true. And so I'll, I'll definitely, I think, talk about anonymity. In my own case, um, at the time, I had two kids and the third one was on its way. And, uh, and for me, it was, you know, if I want my kids to be good citizens of the world, daddy has to um, kind of lead the way. And so I have to, have to speak, I have to do something. And so for me, it was not even an option. I had to tell it because of thanks to my kids, or I would say. Uh, and, uh, and that's what really forced me to, uh, to speak up. Now, anonymity is a, an interesting thing because 
for a long time organization thought that um, you know you, if you have to say something then you have to come with your identity because otherwise we can't communicate and I don't know who, who you are and that's kind of the old days of you know I, I push a letter uh, under the door and then someone's going to figure it out um, and luckily those days are over uh, the idea of anonymity is actually to take the fear and the shame away and to put the organization and the employee on a level playing field and that's really key to enable that uh, that communication and for people to open up uh, otherwise you you will prevent you know um, just uh, under 90 percent of individuals to actually uh, speak up if you don't allow them to at least be anonymous in the first instance and that's really important to to, uh, to be able to build trust yeah and, and it's interesting so i mean your experience i think is quite different from the majority of whistleblowers for many whistleblowers the outcome is not quite as positive as yours was. Now, my recollection of, of our discussions in the past, you were actually recognized by the company in a positive way. You received a promotion and you exposed a multi-million dollar fraud. You know, in your experience, you know, what, what's the typical outcome for a whistleblower? So definitely not great. Um, your, um, I guess, you know, in, in an ideal world, whistleblowers should be celebrated. They should be, you know, seen as heroes and quite often, quite often not. Uh, and, uh, and, and that's definitely, I guess, more perception that in, in reality, what true whistleblowers are, are, you know, they're good citizens. Um, they want the success of the company and they want the, the safety of, you know, the coworkers. Um, and yes, you've got a few exceptions in, in, in that, but the whole majority are good employees that want, uh, you know, the, the right outcome for the organization and, and its employees and, and stakeholders. Uh, uh, unfortunately, that's not what, what's happening. Um, I feel really fortunate and very lucky that Leighton, uh, you know, wanted me to stay uh, within the organization, but also wanted me to see if there was anything else out there that was happening and if I could, you know, help in preventing any um, other, you know, cases of fraud or, or, or corruption within the company. Uh, mm. Unfortunately, it's... Uh, it's not that often that companies will um, recognize um, uh, whistleblowers and keep them on board. Usually it ends up pretty badly. Most of them do not have a job today uh, and uh, or struggle to kind of make a living. Um, and, and I'll actually touch really quickly on this. You know, in the US, we've got a, a bounty program where we reward whistleblowers. And it's something that I, I, I actually fought against in Australia. I said, like, don't implement the reward and the bounty mechanisms in Australia. I think this is sending the wrong message to everyone. Uh, because I don't want people to believe that I'm in it for the money, that I want to retire early, that I want you know, to win the lottery. That's not what we're in it for. However, having a compensation or insurance scheme that if I ever lose my job because I did the right thing, then yes, I should have a compensation, even if it's to pay my salary for life because I'm unemployable, then I think this is fair. But we should kind of make it in a way that is conducive to people don't feel that they they've done something to, you know, just to get out of work and, and retire. And, and in, in the US, you know, a bunch of people will make millions, but it's only a bunch of them out of thousands of cases. And it usually lasts, you know, seven years in average for your uh, matter to be dealt with. And, and only then you might actually, you know, get a bit of a reward. So I think we should definitely think about another, another method in, in Australia. Well, you know, without being too flippant about it, I think, I think you've personally invented another method. I think you know, for me, what must have been certainly a very frightening um, and anxious time, as you say, you had two young children, you had a third on the way, you weren't sure what was going on within the company, but you didn't like what you were seeing, and you came forward. Um, you know, from that experience, that must have been a very, a very sort of pivotal moment for you. Um, and obviously, at some point, and I'd love to hear about that, perhaps in a few moments, at some point, you know, the idea of Wispley came to you and you felt sufficiently empowered by your experience to found the business and, and take it from there. C can you tell us a little bit about that segue and what Wispley yes. does? It was actually when I was at Leighton that I thought about you know, that idea of um, putting the, the employees on a level playing field with the organization and the idea of anonymity but having a two-way conversation, um, that was kind of the idea. And so I went to the um, office of the uh, uh, head of internal audit um, at, at Leighton uh, Holding at the time, now CIMIC, uh, and said, hey, Stephen, I've got that idea of building a platform enabling secure two-way anonymous conversation between an employee and an employer so they can speak up safely. And he said, what a brilliant idea. And so I resigned on the spot, then rang my wife uh, and, uh, and say, hey, darling, I'm just... Uh, uh, leaving the, the company and starting a, a, a business. So the next couple of days were a bit challenging at home uh, and <laughs> the rest is history. 
but again, you know, the idea behind Wispy was I was kind of, um, uh, I knew I was on a mission. So for me, it was, uh, I, I, I had that experience as a whistleblower, I understand what it's like to have that fear that I never uh, had to experience luckily ever after that event. Um, and it's something very unique. Uh, the perspective I've got as a, uh, again, a pseudo investigator slash internal auditor gave me also um, uh, some level of frustration where I knew some stuff was happening and people didn't want to speak up because of fear and shame. Uh, and I, could, I knew I could solve that problem in a way. And uh, very naive, I went on um, and, uh, and it was not my first venture anyway. So I, I went on and, and started Wispy. And the concept was really basic, but it was really also fixing corporate fraud. It was nothing else. And that was where the naivety came into play is I didn't know, actually, the, I didn't understand quite well the bigger picture. Or well, actually, it took me a few years um, to actually fully realize the extent of the problem. It was not just corporate fraud that I wanted to fix. It was a much bigger topic, which is uh, the topic that I call the trusted conversations, meaning I realized over the um, you know, first few months of building Wispy that Yes, we had a great platform um, and it evolved, you know, it keep on evolving every week. But um, um, uh, the issue that I realized that we were facing was it's still a whistleblowing platform. And I don't know anyone that wakes up on a Monday morning thinking, you know what, this is a great week. I'm going to be a whistleblower this week. It doesn't happen that way. And that's the issue that we're all facing. All of the solutions that are rolled out in you know, thousands of companies around the world were created by, you know, a bunch of smart people in a suit in uh, a boardroom thinking we need to you know invent or um, um, you know make available some reporting channels for our people if they want to speak up but it never thought about what type of channels what would make them feel comfortable to come forward and that makes the whole difference um, so when you start with the the understanding that nobody think about becoming a whistleblower because there's nothing sexy about being one uh, unless you want to lose your job and be a wreck for the rest of your life um, um, so you need to understand what whistleblowing is all about. And actually whistleblowing is one type of conversation on the spectrum of what we call trusted conversations. So they might be difficult um, you know, conversation that you wanna have with the organization and it doesn't have to be fraud and corruption. It could be things around, hey, I went to the town hall the other day and the CEO or the CFO or whoever said something that I felt was offensive, offensive to you know, part of our um, employees and, and I just want to provide you that feedback. Um, or it could be something, hey, you know what, I'm working for that company and, um, and, I, and I work 15 hours a day uh, and I can't get the work done. I don't think my boss is happy and I'm close to the burnout. I'm seeking help. And that's having a trusted conversation as well. Or it could be something like, hey, I observe a situation. Um, you know, Joe Blog walks out of the office with a couple of laptops on a Friday night. And I thought it's strange. It never did that before. So I can snap a photo and send that through. Um, and, um, and the company will tell me whether it's because he's got a conference on Monday or whether it's because he actually you know, stole those two laptops. So uh, those trusted conversations can be quite broad. They can relate to you know, COVID as we're all working from home and we, we can well, attack because... I, I agree, you know, uh, you know, a couple of topic examples. If you're a, a kitchen hand or a chef working in the, the restaurant in Potts Point and you notice that somebody's coming into work with symptoms, uh, you know, maybe all of that could have been avoided. I don't know the precise circumstances, but, you know, if you're in an office environment and your boss is coming in clearly sick, you know, you don't want to tell him to go home, but you could use this platform for, for that. Or alternatively, and you, might, you might even know if he's actually sick or if he's got COVID or, you know, he may have, you know, maybe he, he was singing all night and he, he's lost his voice, but you don't know this. And again, it's all about, you don't want to look stupid. You don't want to accuse someone, but you want to say, hey, I think this situation is a bit odd. You know, do you mind checking? I don't feel comfortable. And, and why would you have to actually open up on this and give away your identity? It's not something that is necessary. And if you look at even in our own lives and everybody on, you know, all the attendees, you know, could reflect on one situation in the office where they may have felt, you know, very uncomfortable and maybe they wanted to provide feedback and they didn't because they didn't know what the reaction would have, would have been from, you know, the boardroom or from the attendees. Um, and, and this is what I call it having a trusted conversations. And that happens all the time. And the more you address them, the more people feel comfortable to actually, you know, interact with the company the less they're likely to go onto a website like Glassdoor and put a bad comments, the less likely they are to you know, leave the company one day because they're exhausted about you know, everything that's not working for them. So if you can enable those trusted conversation internally on the full spectrum of conversation, then you're more likely to you know, increase retention, increase productivity, uh, all of those aspects that we don't think about when, when uh, you know, in compliance or in, in legal departments, uh, we think about you know, fraud and corruption as being 
topics that are really important and we only look at channels that you know will enable those you know very narrow conversations to come up but when you ask someone to blow the whistle it's like asking you to drive a car for the first time in your life and i guess most of us on the line you know may have you know may have driven a car for the first time you know years ago it's terrifying it's not you're not the passenger anymore where you can chit chat and look around no no you've got you know traffic lights and pedestrians and, and, and you know, the, the gear lever and the pedals and everything you have to take care of. And that's scary as. And what we're asking our people today is that if they want to speak about safety, you've got to drive that car for the first time. If you want to speak about you know, um, fraud and corruption, you have to drive that truck for the first time. So every time we give them a new set of channels that they have to learn and it's scary. So what about we actually give them a channel or a set of channels that they use for all of those trusted conversations and can build trust over time with those channels. So when the day comes that someone say, you know, steals $20.7 million in a company, you actually don't wait 12 years to pick it up, but you wait you know, 12 hours or 12 days, but not 12 years. Yeah, absolutely. And, and Sylvain, you know, two things we're talking about today, good technology and good mindset. You know, the technology you guys have developed, I think I want to explore that a little bit more, but let's talk about mindset as well. I mean, I've implemented three whistleblowing programs, two of them in publicly listed companies, one in a private company, and I've had varying success. And if I extrapolate the success I've had with these whistleblower programs, there is a direct correlation between management's mindset, their openness, their willingness to embrace change, and their willingness to actually have people come forward and the success of of the whistleblowing platform can you talk to that a little bit yeah definitely and i think you're you know you're spot on the more open you are uh, the more you communicate around it and the more successful you will be unfortunately a lot of companies believe that you know uh, either they want to bury their head in the sand uh, they're just hoping that that ticking bong is not going to explode whilst they're in their position and that they would have moved on and others believe that um, they don't have a problem, like their people are happy, they can go and talk to HR, they can go and talk to their manager, if they've got something to say, we've got, we're very open, we're casual. And, uh, and, um, and that's kind of, again, being very naive in, in the approach. Um, I think it's important for management to set the tone at the top. Um, so you need, to, um, you need to lead by example for sure. You need to communicate and over communicate about um, you know, the fact that you want your employees to speak up and, and be free to do so, that they won't be uh, retaliated against, that they will keep their job. And it's okay to be wrong as well, because you know, um, guess what? In my case, maybe I could have been wrong. And, uh, and the company you know, could have said, hey, Sylvan, that's okay. You, know, you couldn't see the whole, you know, the whole thing, but we digged out you know, in those invoices and that's actually how we did business. And that money was really going to you know, one of our suppliers and not an employee. Uh, but because you've got a narrow view when you're a whistleblower, usually you may not understand the bigger picture. So, you know, I, I think um, building trust is important. Um, uh, leading by example is important. What companies should do is definitely set uh, the tone and having the framework. And the framework is really, you know, what you can and can't do in your company. If you go past that boundary, then, you know, you're, uh, it's unethical and we will not tolerate that. And you need to take action, meaning there's one policy and that applies to whoever you are in the company, whether you're a CEO or someone on the forklift uh, or a salesperson, it doesn't matter where you are, the same rule applies. Uh, and you have to communicate about this to your employees. When something happens, you need to be able to report that. Meaning, uh, let's say we get, we've got 700 reports in the company uh, last year and you know, 20 of them were about sexual harassment and 40 about fraud and corruption, whatever it might be that you can share. You don't have to go into the detail of those uh, matters, but it's important for employees to understand that if I do speak up, it's going to be addressed by the company. I'm going to receive feedback about the, the report that I submitted because receiving no feedback means you took no actions. And maybe there was no actions to be taken, but if I can't get that feedback about the fact that there's no action to be taken, then I'm going to feel bitter that you did nothing about it. So again, communication, feedback, really important. Um, and, and, you know, walk the talk. That's the only thing that will make people want to uh, speak up and speak up more about what might be happening in the company. Thanks, Sylvain. I suppose there's a balance there, isn't there? I mean, you want people to come forward uh, about things that are important, but you don't want to, you know, be so, um, you know, fervent about it that you're encouraging people to come forward with petty complaints and, and minor things. I mean, have you got any suggestions for, for our members who are in-house counsel, obviously, about how you get that balance right? Yep. So for me, the, the, I guess the answer is in 
um, triaging the conversations to, to the right teams. Um, some people will be interested in any safety concern. Some will be interested in something that relates to building management. But you know what? Building management can be uh, uh, you know, uh, a, a, an horrific outcome if you don't take care of your facilities sometimes. So you want someone to receive those complaints. If it's about you know, uh, employee relation, then it can go to the employee relation team or HR. So the idea is how can you actually automatically triage those conversations so the compliance or legal team doesn't get snowed and uh, reports that don't belong, belong to their, uh, you know, to their uh, um, uh, skill sets. Uh, that's the first thing. Now, the other thing is, for instance, with our technology, our clients will receive anywhere between three and 10 times more conversations than they had before. And again, when you say three to 10 times more, it's because some had nothing but like an email address to speak up. And so they got an email every year and now they're getting probably 10 or 20. Um, uh, others had a hotline uh, and they realized that nowadays, People actually don't use a phone to call. They use a phone to chat or a phone to send a message, but they don't call with their phone. Um, so moving to like newer technology enables more conversations as well. But yeah. what happened then is even though they get more conversations, they actually save time. One, they pick up risk early. They make their employees happy, more productive. Uh, they build that trust and they show empathy so employees feel uh, valued uh, and recognized so they're more productive. Um, and, um, and think about, um, you know, that type of technology as being like um, a smoke alarm. Sometime, you know what, it's and in Australia, we hold out that in our, you know, unit or houses, and it's a pain in the neck sometime because it goes up at midnight, and you're well asleep, and you have to wake up, and there's absolutely nothing that happens, and you press that button, and you go back to bed, and then a few months later, it goes up at 3 a.m. in the morning, and there's smoke everywhere, and it saves the family in the house. That's what those systems are all about. Sometimes they just send you kind of signals about, hey, there's a bit of noise in that business unit or in that department. Maybe it's a good idea for us to just go and listen more about what's going on with that manager or that team. And maybe there's something that's actually happening in terms of the, the culture within that specific team. Uh, Sometimes it can be just noise. But for instance, in my own case, the company spent over six months after the event and over $2.5 million to actually try to fix the issue that we created over 12 years. You know, the loss of trust, the loss of brain equity, the loss, the loss of employees through that period because of the frustration of knowing that someone was stealing money and, uh, and I, I work hard to make a living and someone benefit from a crime uh, is not making me happy and I'm going to leave that business. So the loss of all of that for that company was huge. And if only they had received you know, a bunch of reports in the early days, they would have stopped it. So I think companies should embrace more conversations. They should embrace because they're going to deal with them really quickly. Usually it's just a chat of, you know, um, explaining something or checking something, providing feedback. Instead of say, taking six months, it might take, you know, an hour or two or maybe three. But if you can prevent a catastrophe for your organization, then it's well mm -hmm. worth it. And that's, what, that's the feedback at least we receive. Yeah, and I suppose another aspect, I mean, in terms of people who might abuse the system, would you say that um, part of the response should be, or part of the approach rather, should be education and training, you know, teach the staff what is and is not appropriate to report through the whistleblowing uh, platform? This um, is definitely one of them. Uh, this is definitely one of them. And I think it, it does work to some extent, uh, to some extent. Uh, but um, again, it still takes a lot of courage for anyone even to speak up anonymously. For instance, with the Whispy solution, when you do speak up, we talk about trusted conversation and every time you, you wanna engage in a conversation, you've got different ways of doing that. It could be through uh, you know, filling in a form like the old days of filling in a form and then chatting with the company after that if they need to, uh, uh, if they need to ask you more questions. Or it could be just a live chat, like having an, a, a type of anonymous WhatsApp. Um, uh, this is what we provide as well. Or it could be a virtual hotline where instead of speaking to a human, which is terrifying for most whistleblowers, I speak to a machine, I can change my voice and re-record my message before I actually submit it. So all of those things that enable uh, uh, the employee to build trust with the technology and then with the company is conducive to, to them to, uh, uh, to, 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 to speak up safely. Uh, but but, uh, but it, we, it still takes a lot of courage to speak up. Um, that's what I want to yeah. say. It's, can we pause on that for a second? Because I know a lot of people will be very dubious uh, about anonymity generally, when, also when it comes to technology, because you know there's, there's typically a way around it or the administrator of the system can get the details or whatever. You know, can you just give us, give us two minutes on why the anonymity through your system is pretty much guaranteed? So it's guaranteed because you never have to put any of your contact details, no email, no phone, no name, no whatever. 
It's like creating your own Gmail account in a way or Yahoo mail account, um, except that you, you, know, you could be Tintin123 and then make up your password and you can access it from anywhere. Yes, you've got a mobile app, but you can be on any web browser anywhere around the world using any computer. So no one would know who you are and there's no trustability back to that device uh, anywhere. The organization doesn't have access. However, when you're in that safe inbox and you start a conversation with your company, the system gives you an avatar for each of those conversations. So the first one, you might be the, you know, the, the blue pizza and you talk about the fact that you work 15 hours and can't get the work done. The second conversation a few months later could be about a different topic and you might be the yellow lizard. And so on each conversation, even though you, are, you have the choice to be anonymous in the early days and the company will know you as per that avatar, if you want to give away your identity because you have to, in the case of, let's say, um, sexual harassment, uh, once you've built trust and you feel empowered that, yes, you can speak up and, and open up and give away your name, they'll know who you are behind that avatar, but they still won't know who you are behind the other avatars, uh, you know, in the previous conversations or future conversations you're going to have. And that's the whole so idea of... So the employer organization does not have access to your details unless you choose to give it to them. Correct. Exactly. And indeed... Even Wispley doesn't have access to the information. It's Correct. all completely secured, completely Everything's encrypted. encrypted. Correct. Everything's encrypted. There's no trustability of the IP addresses uh, whatsoever. And, uh, and that's really safe for um, employees or even, I would say, employers to use, of course. And if documents or photographs are sent, uh, my understanding is uh, from discussions with you in the past, yeah. all the yeah. metadata is removed. So Correct. you can't and tell a... who took the photo, where it was taken, etc. Exactly, and there's also an antivirus check done uh, on all of those files. So if someone wanted to corrupt, you know, a computer within the organization, they wouldn't be able to do that as well. Yeah, yeah. So again, the, the whole idea is how can you build trust, show empathy, get the information you need as an organization to be able to progress with your investigation or investigate that disclosure, but also make sure that you respect the employees uh, or sometimes the suppliers or customers if you open it up to, you know, third parties as you should. Uh, mm -hmm. It's very important as well that you uh, uh, you enable those um, those opportunities for them to remain anonymous. And in my own case, I think if we still had been there, you know, in uh, in 2012, um, I would definitely have used it anonymously in the first instance, and I would have give up my name at the end because I was proud of you know what I, what I did in 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 a way. Uh, and just on that point, something really important that I think everybody should kind of take home as well is we quite often. Um, take care in a way of the uh, the fraudster uh, by making sure that we either fire him and then he's going to start doing that in another company or we sue him in some instances but we don't really take care about the whistleblower and for me um the image that i keep about uh what i did was i felt that i was holding a gun and i had the, the power to pull that trigger uh, and i could have let it go and that guy was retired six months later and nothing would have happened to his family he was married he had a daughter that was about to get married or i could pull the trigger and destroy the life of a family and, and friends. And that's the path that I took. And no one was there to ask me if I was okay. And I think that's really important for companies out there, mostly when it's about the course, sexual harassment, bullying, discrimination, all of those topics that are even worse than what I had to experience. But even at my level, I was heavily impacted by that event and no one ever asked me the question if I was okay. Hmm. Well, I hope you're okay now. I am. Thank you. And I'm really proud that we can actually help others. So uh, I definitely uh, went over that, uh, that uh, experience in a positive way, I'd say. But I think it's important for people to notice that it's not that easy to be a whistleblower. It's not just that, hey, just tell us what you've got to say. It doesn't happen that way. I'm usually pretty open, pretty vocal. I can tell you that that day, my whole world went upside down. I'll bet it did. And, you know, whistle, whistleblowing has moved on a lot since those days. I mean, you've seen, obviously, that we've had new legislation that took effect one July last year, which has, you know, significantly broadened the scope of people who can be whistleblowers, including, you know, extending it from not just current employees to former employees, suppliers. You can now uh, make a whistleblowing uh, complaint to a, a member of the media. Um, uh, you know, the legislation uh, has also introduced protections, additional protections beyond those originally in the Corporations Act for whistleblowers themselves. Um, so it's it's a much friendlier environment to be a whistleblower. But, you know, some people would say that uh, that legislation is really aimed at just big companies, not small companies. 
And, you know, from, from what I know of your system, Sylvain, obviously I've implemented it at two larger companies, but most of our members tend to work for, you know, medium-sized businesses or in some cases, small businesses. Well, what would you say to them in terms of um, this system and, and also whistleblowing generally? So I guess before I answer that question, I'll go back to the legislation itself. Um, legislations are fantastic, not for whistleblowers. They're fantastic for to force companies to actually put systems and processes in place to actually make the environment safer for their employees you know, to speak up. But nobody in Australia, I don't know anyone that knows about the whistleblowing legislation. So don't expect employees to know their rights. Uh, and even if they knew them, they would think, oh, what if my company operates in the US, for instance, can they sue me from the US? Or can they sue me from you know, Japan or France or wherever they might be? There would always be that fear that am I really protected? Um, you know, if I left after X number of days or month, um, they will always have that doubt about you know, protection. So for me, legislation is not so much useful to give an incentive for people to come forward. That's definitely not what's gonna happen. However, it's forcing companies to do the right thing or at least take some steps in the right direction to enable more people to you know, feel comfortable to speak up. Again, if you have the right channels. Now going back to you know, uh, big companies versus small companies, for me, whether you're one of the largest mining company in the country or whether you've got um, a restaurant with 40 staff, you've got the same need. You've got people in a restaurant that could observe food hygiene problem, theft, discrimination, sexual harassment, bullying, um, all of those things can happen in a small business. And today they've got nothing about, you know, being able to speak to the to the boss and quite often in those small companies everybody is your colleague is your friend is your mate and you don't want to dub it onto anyone however what they've done is wrong and you know it and so the ability to help those individuals to speak up and engage in a conversation with the restaurant owner or whatever that might be is really important as well and as key as you know for a big uh, organization and and go, going into that kind of direction we actually always had a vision with our business to democratize trusted conversation and make it accessible to anyone, whether you're a BHP Billiton or the small cafe down the street on your street. Well, uh, I was going to say, yeah, big business is quite happy to spend ten or twenty or thirty thousand dollars on a, a you know sophisticated system like Whisply, but your restaurant isn't going to do that. Correct, and, and that's a really good point, and that's not their priority, to be honest, because again. I'm running a small business, there's 25 of us, and I don't believe anyone is doing anything wrong, like any small business owner. We recruited our people, we trust them, their family, and there might well be something happening, not necessarily about that, but it could be you know, a discrimination, it could be someone you know, being a bully or whatever it might be, and I'm maybe not aware of it. And so we actually you know, eat our own dog food and we've got Wispy internally, we do, uh, we do use it um, uh, internally, and it's fantastic. So what we've done, uh, um, and actually that was triggered during, um, you know, in the early days of the, the, the current crisis in, uh, in uh, about mid-April, we actually released um, a free product for any company out there. Um, and that's the ability for anyone, whether you're even a big company, it doesn't matter, to actually have the system in place to enable your people to communicate. And we called it with the open line. And the whole idea came when we saw a lot of um, leaders that were telling us, hey, we don't know if our people are okay. Uh, whether they were um, uh, business owners or HR leaders, uh, you know, managers, the struggle was now they're working from home and we don't know if they're okay. And they've got nowhere to reach out to us because we don't have the coffee machine or the water cooler anymore. And so we released that solution um, in, in April. And that was fantastic to see that actually now employee can reach out to their employer just similarly to WhatsApp, but in an anonymous fashion and engage about you know, the fact that they work from home and they've got their partner 24 seven, they've got the kids running around, they can't find the time to concentrate during normal working hours, uh, or they fear about losing their job because there's so many people that are losing their jobs you know, everywhere around the planet. That created a lot of anxiety, a lot of stress, um, and people wanted to be able to reconnect with their company. And that's what triggered for us the need to actually release that free product. But otherwise, for anyone that wants to benefit from all of our features, including our case management, where you can manage like full investigations, the minimum um, uh, it will cost you to get a solution like Whisply is $4,500 a year. Uh, and with that, you've got everything you want to make it work. And, uh, and that's, that's the best insurance you will ever have for your business. Because again, it's not just about preventing corruption, but it's about employee well-being and, and looking after your people, to make sure that they're actually as productive as they can and as well as they can in, in your environment. Mm. So did you say $4,500 for $4,500? Correct. 
But that's not a lot of money. That's not a lot of money. And that's it what is. you would pay to get, uh, you know, all of the features that we split. And if you don't want a case management, then you put it for nothing. Yeah, yeah. Sylvain, I think we've got uh, just over 15 minutes left and I want to just encourage people to submit questions through the Q&A function on the app. Uh, we've already answered one during the course of our discussion, but if anyone does have any questions they'd like to send through uh, to Sylvain, send them through on the Q&A now. We'll keep talking and as questions come through on the q and I'll raise them. But, um, Look, Sylvain, one of the, one of the things uh, that has been also topical, you know, we talked about COVID recently, you know, but the High Court, Dyson Hayden, uh, I mean, the alleged conduct that has occurred there has occurred over a long period of time. Many women have been involved and have come forward. Uh, and this is the highest court in the land. I mean, this sounds like a situation where <laughs> Wispley could have prevented this years ago. Yep. And, and again, I go back to, you know, the, uh, uh, oh, in this case, there's, uh, I guess, power is involved as well. Um, uh, and you know, being in a position of power and, uh, and, and being able to show that you are in that position of power, I think was really important for that individual. We saw that in the one scene case, for instance, where uh, in, that, in that case, you know, there were uh, 87 victims. A lot of people, you know, say, oh, there was not 87 victims, a lot of them wanted to kind of benefit from, you know, whatever reward would be handed over. Okay, let's remove 90% of them, assuming they're all fake. You're still left with about nine victims of the, on the one sticking case and it's still nine, you know, too many. And, and how can we actually make sure that those victims can raise their voice before, you know, um, before the 10 or 20 years at mark? In, in, in that case, it was decades. And I think that's really what's important there. Again, going back to removing the, uh, the fear and the shame, that, that is what is enabling people to, um, to speak up. And in the case of sexual harassment, um, you have to realize that it doesn't take like five minutes for someone to think they're gonna pick up the phone and speak up. It's just too hard. So they need to be able to put their throat down on like a kind of a draft before they can actually submit anything. And it might take weeks or months before they find the strength of doing it. But if you don't allow them to be anonymous, at least in the first instance, then most of them, if not all, will not speak up. But if you go back to Weinstein, it took only one victim to speak up for all of the other 86 to come out in a matter of weeks. And so once they realized that they were not the only one and that others were impacted, they want that to stop. But in their own mind, most of them were thinking about, hey, you know what, it was too late at night. I really wanted that job. My skirt was too short, too much makeup. They were blaming, blaming themselves. And you know what, it's, it, it, even in my fraud case, I was blaming myself for putting someone's life you know, in, uh, in jeopardy because I was put, potentially you know, putting it behind bars. So I was blaming myself. And you need to be able to build that trust with the company and do it slowly, take your time. Anonymity is your best asset. Of course, at some point that victim would have to speak up. But the idea of anonymity is to build trust and provide options. It's about saying, hey, you can go to that employee assistance program. You can go to that person within HR. You can come and see you know, that individual within the organization. We're here to help uh, and showing empathy. If the victim doesn't want to seek help, then of course you can't you know, um, uh, take the risk of interviewing someone um, uh, uh, just like this. But by building empathy, most likely they will actually give away their identity. Yeah, yeah, agreed. But we do have a question from the floor, uh, which is uh, given the current economic conditions and particularly on the job front, should we expect that whistleblowers are going to be even less likely now to come forward for fear of losing their jobs? Do you, do you think that's going to be an emerging trend? Yeah, so that, that's definitely a good point. There's two things here. When you've got a crisis, you've got usually a huge spike in um, theft, fraud, corruption. All of those things are happening, uh, um, I guess, exponentially because what's happening is part of us are looking at it thinking, oh, I may lose my job or think my go pear shape and maybe it's time to actually, you know, take advantage of the situation. Um, so usually that's why, you know, um, cases of fraud and corruption go up. Uh, but you're right, people fear that they might lose their job if they do speak up because they could be seen as the troublemaker. And so um, if you don't have the right mechanisms in place, don't expect your people to just pick up the phone or send a fax or an email uh, and raising you know, um, an, a, um, a concern because that's unlikely to happen because they need to go into self-preservation mode themselves as well. They need to protect their family themselves and their job. And so they will not speak up if, they don't, if they're not equipped with the right channels. So it's kind of a double-edged sword for those companies is not only they're facing the 
the risk of having an increase of fraud and corruption, which by the way, they will only realize months or years down the track for most of them uh, because they won't pick it up. Um, and, and the fact that some employees will not speak up, but also will have that feeling of, you know, why would I work hard while well, some are, you know, committing a crime? And um, so I'm just going to do the nine to five and I may call in sick, you know, once in a while and productivity is going to go down. That's really what I experienced uh, when, when I was at, at Leighton. But that's something that can be turned around. Again, it doesn't take uh, much, but it has to be, you know, again, set from the top of the company and, uh, and, and communication is key around that. And the tools that you give to your employees to speak about, of course, key as well. Mm. Okay, thank you. Um, another question, uh, you know, our members are all in-house counsel, right? I mean, uh, is this thing going to uh, create additional workload for them or is it something that's going to, you know, make their life easier um, or, or neither? So I mean, likely it will definitely make their life easier because again, it's all about being able to triage those incoming reports. So the system can do that based on what the um, employee or the informant is talking about. Uh, so that's kind of taking the load to the right team. Uh, so only a handful of them will get to, uh, I guess, to the level of a, of a general counsel. Uh, and, and again, it's better for them to tackle those issues while they're small problems rather than a big one, uh, because uh, that's going to enable them to save a lot of time. Quite often, it's just about you know, checking the facts, being able to assess whether or not there's uh, wrongdoing or unethical uh, behavior happening and addressing it instead of waiting you know, 12 years and, and ending up having to deal with a $20.7 million fraud. That's a, a, different, uh, a different issue to tackle. Uh, and, and again, you know, another way we, uh, so some companies um, do have some kind of, I, I call them clunky systems and they don't get a lot of reports. And, uh, and one thing that we also um, uh, realize is you need to give an incentive or you need to incentivize your employees to speak up. You need to ask them the question. And of course, when you've got you know, thousands of employees, it's not, it's not easy to do and ask them all the same question. However, you can do a survey. And so we've got that feature within the, the Wispy platform where you can actually launch a survey. And that could be something as like a happiness survey. Uh, and you know, tell us how happy are you to work for our company on a scale from one to five. One, I'm not happy and five, I'm super happy. And for any answer that they provide between one and four, you tell them uh, automatically with the, an automation saying, hey, how can, we get, we, how can we get you to a five? And that's how you actually force people to speak up and open up about something. And you may learn about those issues that you know, may be under, um, uh, um, under, under the radar in your company, whether it's around discrimination, whether it's about fraud, whether it's about misconduct, whatever it might be, that's how you'll pick up those signals. And so companies should actually be willing to listen and, and get those reports and feedback. And the best way to do it is through a survey. And if you make it you know, uh, really interactive and, and with an automation that say, hey, how can we get you to a five? Uh, they will start, for some of them, they will start to open up and tell you what's bugging them. And they might say, hey, you know what? Every Monday when I go into the office um, and we do the, the weekly kickoff, uh, something is being said about you know, the color of my skin or, or whatever, or the way I look or my glasses. And, uh, and it doesn't put me in the best you know, mood for the week. And, uh, and if we could just change that, I would feel a lot better. It can be just something like this. Um, and that would, you know, if you can make one employee a lot happier to come to work, that's a massive win because you win in terms of productivity, happiness, all of that is really important for companies. But you need to think beyond just your, I guess, profession. Yeah. And, and is that survey tool, Sylvain, come as part of the package with your product or is it's it a standalone thing? thing or? So it's, it's, uh, if you use Wispley, you've got access to, uh, to, uh, to our case management. You've got access to open line, which is that anonymous WhatsApp. Wispley Pulse is, the, uh, is the, the survey feature, which is also a free, uh, a free tool. So if companies just want to do uh, you know, um, a Pulse and then use the uh, anonymous um, 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 conversation um, app, they can do that as well for free. So again, our role is to democratize those trusted conversation. And a bit like you know, Google does with Gmail, Nobody pays for Gmail. I do pay for Gmail for my company because I want to secure it. And, uh, but I've got a personal Gmail account for 15 years, never paid for it, and will never pay for it. The same thing applied to Wispley. Some companies need more security, need case management, need more features. They pay for a solution. I still want to help the small one that you know, can't afford it or don't want to pay for it because I, I think their employees deserve uh, to have the best tool uh, in their hands. You know, we always talk about, um, in Australia, the, uh, the bring your own device, you know, and, and we quite often talk about this for the laptop and the, and the phone. When you get a new job, the company will say, hey, if you're a Mac person, bring your Mac and we'll, you know, we'll secure it for you and you can use it at work instead of having to work on a Windows machine. 
But the first thing that companies should actually uh, let their people bring to the office is the tool that they're willing to use to engage in those trusted conversations. And so our role at Wispy is to make it available to anyone at no cost. And by the way, that very same tool, whether it's the mobile app that you've got or the access on, online, your safe inbox, you can keep it from one company to another. So you may have used Wispy at uni and then you can bring it to work in your first company and carry it along uh, you know, as you move from one company to another. The way you get to your new company um, uh, form is by scanning a QR code or link, clicking on a URL link. And that's how you can connect with that new company. So super easy to use. And again, it's all about building trust. You're not changing your Gmail account every time you change companies. You keep it you know, for your personal conversation and you're gonna take it to your grave you know, in 50 years or whatever it's gonna be. Uh, the same should happen for your, you know, your safe inbox that you feel comfortable to use for those trusted conversations. Mm. No, thank you. I mean, when you and I first worked together years ago, I think it was 2015 or 2016, Wispley was still, you know, version 1.0. And I've seen, you know, various additions and to the system and it's become a much more sophisticated platform since then. Um, now you have the anonymous polling um, and the, the, the free version of it available through your website. I mean, what's what's next for you guys? You must all already be uh, thinking of, of more innovation. So I'm always frustrated because I'd love to be able to do more you know, every day. But one thing is sure is we'll never stop building stuff. We're a software company and we're here to solve a problem. So we always reinvent ourselves. Uh, and just to give you kind of a, uh, an idea of where we're going uh, long term is, um, you know, I guess most of us on the line, you know, are, um, are uh, use Uber once in our lives. And with Uber, you rate the driver and the driver rates you so you can build trust. And you know that when the driver comes, he's got you know, 4.7 stars or whatever it might be uh, and vice versa. The same thing will happen over time with Wispy where we want the trusted conversation to be rated as well. I want to rate the experience that I had with my company and the company wants to rate the experience with that informant, even though they don't know who that is. Um, and by receiving a report and getting a rating, a prompt, um, you might actually build the trust quickly quicker than, uh, than not having a rating. And the idea for companies is to be able to actually leverage that rating and say and recruit people by saying, hey, look, at my company, we've got 4.8 stars out of five on Wispley. So we're a trusted organization. You know, we're here to build trusted conversation um, and, uh, and, and you are welcome to work for us because we will listen to you. So it's kind of the thing where we're going. Uh, so it's, it's, it's definitely going beyond whistleblowing. For me, if you just talk about whistleblowing, you're dead in the water. You know, forget it. It's not going to help your company. If you do a whistleblowing policy and a whistleblowing platform, it will never work. You will pick one report here and there, but it's not going to solve the bigger picture. So the idea, again, about Wispy is to be able to build that ecosystem where companies can build trust and also use that, um, use that to actually recruit the best talent. And for talent to say, hey, You've got two out of five on Wispy. I'm not going to work for you because I don't feel, you know, that it's a great environment for me to to go and working. So it's kind of a, an incentive for companies to also do the right thing. But that's kind of a long shot. So that's a that's probably in the, let's say three years from now. Excellent. Well, I I look forward to seeing that. And I presume if people want to find out more, uh, they go to your website, which is wispy.com. Com. Well, correct, wispy.com. Um, if you want to email me, um, just write down my first name that you can see on the screen. It's not the easiest one, but uh, and it's sylvain at wispy.com. You can find me on uh, on LinkedIn as well. Happy to uh, answer any of your questions uh, you know, after that uh, that webinar. I think that's uh, definitely a topic that I'm passionate about, um, and uh, and we learn about it every day. You know, we do some. Uh, uh, we're doing an interesting case study with uh, Harvard Business School at the moment, and, and a large uh, organization. Uh, and um, and uh, and so there's a uh, there's a lot of knowledge that we've acquired over the years, uh, but there's still more that we're learning every day with uh, with our clients and, and partners. So it's uh, it's been an interesting journey, but uh, uh, yeah, more, more to come. Well, Sylvain, it's been a real pleasure talking to you this morning, and uh, I, I hope our our visitors who participated in the webinar have enjoyed it as much as I have. Um, I wish you all the success uh, that you can enjoy in democratizing whistleblowing, and I look forward to uh, to seeing more of Wispley in the future. And thank Thanks you on behalf of, of ACC and our members for your time today. My pleasure. Thank you so much.